Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today we're joined by Dr. Patrick Ward and Dr. Scott Morrison. Patrick Ward is the Director of Research and Analysis at the Seattle Seahawks and a statistics professor at Lehman College. He has a PhD in sport and exercise science and remains active in the scientific space through both research and his blog, OptimumSportsPerformance.com. Scott Morrison is currently working as a senior sports scientist in MLB. His diverse career in sports medicine and performance include highlights such as time spent as the director of sports medicine for the MLS Professional Referee Organization and high performance roles with the Special Forces as a contractor for both the U.S. Air Force and Army Special Operations Command. He also serves as the chair of the AASPT Sports Performance Enhancement SIG and was selected as a 2023 NSCA Sports Medicine Professional of the Year. Outside of his work, Scott is finishing a PhD under Franco and Pelizzari and Patrick Ward through the University of Verona with a focus on measurement theory and predictive modeling. Very informative podcast this episode, everything regarding measurement. Selfishly, Patrick Ward as an individual, I always want to learn from. Every time there's a book recommended by Patrick, I immediately buy it and, and invest in it because I want to learn. I'm very interested in measurement, poor measurement, logical fallacies, and reliability and validity in all this information that's accumulated, in, not just in sports science, but just in anything, being a better critical thinker. And Patrick's the guy, uh, for me at least, that, that, that I've really learned from. But I've also learned a ton recently in, in being introduced to Scott's work. I've, I, uh, I follow him on social media. He's a very interesting individual as well. Super, super bright. We speak about what I call this idea of measurement error. It was a conversation that I, I, I wanted to get both of them on the podcast from a Twitter tweet that uh, Patrick had tweeted out regarding measurement. And it's a, the very last sentence of the tweet states, bad measurement means any model you construct is off to the wrong foot. So I wanted to dive deeper and deeper into the conversation, selfishly learn a lot myself, but hopefully scale that audience uh, to other performance professionals as well uh, and allowing us to collect better information, analyze better information, and more importantly, collecting reliable information. It's a fantastic podcast. Welcome in. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having us. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, you know what, uh, Scott, looking forward to learning from you. Uh, this will be a first time for me. Uh, we have met through the Twitter universe. Patrick, uh, I've told you this before, I'll tell you again. Probably one of the brightest individuals I've had the opportunity to speak with. Every time you speak, I learn something and feel stupid, not in a bad way, but I, I need to educate myself and backtrack. Um, and uh, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. Um, I don't know what to call this podcast episode. I, I kind of wanted to have a play on words, calling it measurement error. Um, but <laughs> but I want to talk about all things measurement and what two better individuals to speak with uh, than the both of you. But this was the, the quote, Patrick, that really caught my eye and made me want to speak. It was on Twitter and you had tweeted this out. It says, quote, measurement is such an important topic that gets almost hand waved away in some of our education. I can't read enough on this topic. Bad measurement means any model you construct is off on the wrong foot. Could you expand on that a little bit for me? Yeah. Well, yeah. Thanks for the great intro. Uh, you're too kind. And it's better that you name this podcast than let Scott and I do it because we come up with, <laughs> we come up with something that'll get us canceled real fast. Uh, yeah. I mean, you know, if I think back to like educational pathway, um, most of us, well, Scott obviously went a physical therapy route, but mo most of us, you know, even through undergraduate had the same pathway and then we've sort of veered off. And that was something that was probably like exercise science, kinesiology based type of, you know, thing. Uh, and, and you learn through your classwork, all the physiology and the biomechanics, and you take those kinds of classes and you take like one stats class. And that stats class is like the most basic thing ever. It's like mean, median, mode, standard deviation, quantile, 
um, correlation, uh, linear regression, uh, maybe something with like odds ratios and a two by two table. And there's probably like one chapter of 10 pages where they say, and make sure things are valid and reliable. <laughs> and then they move on, right? And it's kind of hand waved away um, because it's like, well, let's get to the good stuff. Let's get to making a, a little bit of a model, a linear regression, a simple linear regression model, or let's get to um, let's get to doing something rather than thinking about the thing that it is we're trying to do. And so we kind of hand wave this thing away, and that gets passed down into all of the papers that we read. Like every paper that you read measures something for the most part. And every method section in every one of those papers has some sort of sentence that says, this was found to be valid. Uh, you know, this GPS unit was found to be valid previously. And it's like, well, valid and reliable for what, for whom, what context, um, is it even relevant to the population that I have? Should I be doing my own validation and reliability? Should I be looking at these things within the question that I want to ask? And so we, we hand wave these things away and, um, and then we get out into the world and we find that things are really difficult to do. There's lots of things we can measure as my PhD supervisor, uh, you know, Barry Drust used to tell me just because we can measure it doesn't mean we should. Uh, and just because we can measure it doesn't mean that it's useful. And um, you get out and then you do things like, you know, I think probably what spawned a lot of this open dialogue in, on Twitter with that quote was Scott and I attended uh, the national conference of the NSCA and we went to a uh, some sort of sports science uh information group or a special interest group. Sorry. That's what it was. And they were talking about like, what kind of things do people need? What do strength coaches want? And, and, you know, it's this room packed with people and we're standing in the back and the things that people are asking for, are like, Oh, can we get like an Excel sheet of what the best force plate is to buy? Can we get, you know, can you rank the best GPS units? And I'm thinking like, well, why is it? That's just the technology. Like that has no, I, what is it you're trying to do with this, right? And so that's when I posted a blog post that had like eight or 10 papers on validity and reliability and sensitivity or, or uh, uh, responsiveness, depending on if you're reading in psychology or clinical measure measurement, they call it different things. But um, yeah, that was kind of like the, the crux of the discussion. And as far as like, you know, what we should do about it, um, I mean, I don't really know. I, I'm you know, I'm loosely an educator. I teach one class in stats, you know, at a, at a school, but, uh, and I try and make this an important thing. Like the, the most important thing is the question that you're asking, not so much the, the model that you want to build. If you, you could build a model on really bad data and talk about it eloquently, uh, but at the end of the day, it has no utility for its purposes. And that that's the problem, I think. Yeah. <laughs> You talked about bad measurement. Maybe I'll pass this to you, Scott. What are the things that you look at for a good measurement? You and I spoke off the air about validity. I can tell you right now, I get confused with validity. There's construct validity, face validity, criterion validity. I mean, I heard this and I want to paraphrase this because I don't want to quote it from, I had the opportunity to speak with, I believe your PhD supervisor, Franco, correct? Mm -hmm. um, and yep. he had mentioned this idea of validity and correct me if I'm wrong on this, but he said it's a broad concept, but it should be narrowly applied, right? So you might have a valid reading for your heart rate running, collecting that, but that doesn't mean it's a good proxy for neuromuscular fatigue, if that makes sense. And maybe I'm misunderstanding that quote, um, but what kind of validity should we be looking for? Yeah, I think the problem is the belief that validity is, oh, in this I need a construct validity, in this I need face validity, in this I need... We divide this up to make it easier to have discussions, um, but validity as a concept is if uh, there's various definitions and to Patrick's point, a lot of the issues that we see in uh, our domain 
are unique to our domain. Like a lot of these conversations, this is what psychology battled with for the last 140 years, right? So there is a very, very broad understanding and discussion and lively debate around validity. It's not a settled topic. It's not a thing that everybody agrees on. You don't go to the dictionary and look up, oh, validity, this is the definition. So like uh, Bornsbroom is a, a more current person who pushes back on the other. But currently, if you go to the standards of measurement and education, which is kind of the uh, three biggest domains, so education, psychology, and uh I'm blanking on the third group um, that they basically write the standards and it's here is how we view things. Right. So it's the consensus statement, as it were. And currently validity is viewed more as a um, think of it more as cumulative evidence to support the inference that you are drawing to your particular decision. So uh, back in the day, they talked about the nomological web. Um, of as you accumulate evidence, you get more support for the inference you're drawing. As you get more support, you're able to ask better questions. And this is somewhat to the point of uh, Hassock Chang's idea of that epistemic iteration, right? We're, we're building validity by examining this deeper. By examining this deeper, we're building more validity. So I think the easiest way to think of validity is how confident are you that the decision you're making is supported by the evidence that you have, right? So if you if you think of it as the heart rate, so to Franco's point about narrowly applied, I think there's a difference there of validity, but also it comes down to the idea of a proxy measure. And if we think of the construct, so this, again, psychology dealt with this because they were faced early on with the fact that you know, anger, depression is not something I can take out a ruler and measure, oh, there's four units of uh, depression here. So they were faced with the idea, we do not have the ability to use physical measures to map directly onto these things that we care about, these constructs. And early on, that was a big debate is, can you even measure something that's not physical? So psycho again, psychology had to do this in education the same. How do you measure whether somebody is more like when we look at our aptitude tests, if we look at the GRE, all of these things are we're using proxy measures to tell us something about the individual. I want to know how good he is at math. And so I'm asking multiple questions and think of it as each question is giving us a little piece of information about your map aptitude. And the goal of test development is to get enough of those pieces put together that we get a general idea of map aptitude. So when we think of heart rate, if we are using heart rate to tell us something about the impact of the uh, training session we just did, it can tell us something about that. However, we need to be aware that two people running the same pattern and one of them is stressed out and anxious is going to be running a much higher heart rate than the other one. And let's say somebody else is on beta blocker. So all of a sudden that heart rate doesn't map directly onto the necessarily the demands, the external load uh, that we have. And that variance, that difference between the metric that we are getting an assigning a number to and the construct that we care about the training effect of this uh event that we just engaged in that's where the, the theory of validity starts being really important is how confident am i that the numbers that i got for the heart rate are telling me something about the stress level or the external load that was applied to this individual. And that's where something Patrick talks about a lot and myself as well is we need to move away from point estimates and start talking about distributions. So how, like what range are we confident that this falls within? And as we start understanding this idea of distributions, we start understanding the level of uncertainty that we're dealing with. And I think that's fundamentally to me, validity is how uncertain am I? And as I add validity evidence, I'm narrowing those confidence intervals or I'm narrowing those credible intervals and that expertise, good validity, et cetera, makes those intervals narrow enough that I can actually act on my decision with some degree of confidence for whatever it is that I'm trying to do. Wow. Okay. And I, I want to try to unpack some of this and Patrick, I'm going to push it back to you. You had mentioned in your PhD studies about the GPS. 
you know, you have to ask the right questions. If I'm a strength coach right now, right, like right now, and I'm faced with measuring external load, right now the best tool to do that would be a, you name the company, right, but some sort of a GPS device, right? Is that, I'm not, I'm not trying to sound ignorant when I say this. The question I'm asking is external load. Is it, does it have to be situationally dependent or, or, or is that the wrong tool? Meaning, listen, I'm just measuring external load. Give me the highest valid or the best company to go with that has the fewest measurement error. That's, that's who I'm going with because that's what I'm measuring. Hey, I'm measuring RSI. It's Hawking Dynamics or Vol. They got the best tool. I'm going with that. Uh, the, I guess the first kind of question um, I'd ask back to a strength coach who asked that question is, <laughs> um, is uh, what what do you want to do with the number? <laughs> like, 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 let's say you buy the GPS unit and you put it on Scott between his scapula and you say, go run around. We're going to have a, a session. And he comes back and it says 200. What do you want to do? Right. Like those are the questions I get, right? It's like, which force push I use? Which GPS unit should I use? Which heart rate variability, heart rate monitor, heart rate variability, whatever it is, what bio, blood, uh, blood biomarker, you know, my thing isn't like, what should you be using? It's what do you, what do, what do you intend to get from this? Like, I'm not, I can't tell you that measuring GPS is good for you or your athletes. If I don't know what it is you're trying to do. Right. Like if you said, you know, we go out and we run and we do these running sessions and I'd really like to have a good way of understanding how my periodization is increasing the volume of running over time on the field. Like, well, maybe a GPS unit or like a friggin' pedometer or something like that is a good thing because then you'd be like, okay, we did, you know, a thousand yards today and, you know, and then we did 1500 yards the next day and 2000 and then we backed down and then we went up again, you know, like some of this, it, it, to me, it always comes back to whenever someone has a question, whether it's like in this field or, or different field at work or something like that, it's always like, okay, can you walk me through? Like my, my question back to, to them is always like, walk me through how you want to use this. Like if I could get you that tomorrow, if I could get you your GPS rating or your RSI mod tomorrow, walk me through how you want to use it. Because once you start to explain to me the ways in which you want to operationalize your decisions, then I can start to think about, is this even the best thing to help us measure that? And if we're going to use this thing to measure that outcome how well does it map to that? How noisy is it? How much error is it? How much uncertainty do we have in the measurement? Like those kinds of things. But the the question that's the, you know, the vague question of, I need to measure external load, which GPS units should I buy? I'm like, I would probably buy none of them right now because you don't have a question, <laughs> right? If that makes sense, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, we, we, we have... Um... We had the opportunity to, to work with Catapult for a bit. And the goal for me was to understand what a normal practice would look like, what a normal game would look like, and then what a body of work, meaning a week of load would look like over the course of the season. I literally, the first year I used it, I was just trying to get an idea of what that looked like before any decisions were made. Truthfully for us too, and, and this is a, this was an eye opener for me, and, and I'm not speaking poorly about anything, and, and maybe Scott, you can answer this question for me, or Patrick, we talked off air on this. I mean, regardless of who the maker is, force plates are big and sexy now. You can you could spend a day looking at a jump, all right? And what I did is I, one, of the, one of the metrics I really wanted to focus on was left and right propulsive or breaking impulse index because this big idea of asymmetry, this 15% asymmetry. Well, we had over 300, four, almost 350 tests with our with our asymptomatic jumpers and geez, almost 20% of them had asymmetries over 15%. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe that's like such a, like uh, maybe that's a really noisy, I, I haven't looked at that metrics. Maybe it's like really noisy. I, I mean, it's funny too, because like, when people do this stuff in research, they say, we're going to do a reliability study on this jump metric. And they they test a group of people and then they wait five minutes and test them again. And they're like, 
<laughs> oh wow cool and so we minus column two from you know column one and we take the standard deviation of the difference and we divide by root two and we get a standard error measurement and then we can slap a confidence interval around and we feel really good about it and it's like this is awesome. Like our error of measurement is five, right? And then you get into the real life setting, like you're talking about, and you start measuring people from, you know, week to week and they've gone through played games and their bodies have changed. And some of them have got dinged up and nicked up in a game. And some of them have had injuries or coming back from injuries and some of them haven't played much. And so they're physically maybe able to perform at a higher level on something like a jump because they're not expressing themselves in a game setting. And all of a sudden that standard error of five on a week to week variance becomes like 40 and everybody, you, you go to the coach and you say, bad news, everybody is flagged this week. <laughs> well, what do you want me to do? Not practice? Yeah. Um, you know, like, the, the, like again, so, you know, reliability has its own like kind of issues similar to what Scott talked about with validity is like reliable for what reliable if I jump five minutes apart or like how much variance would I expect week to week across let's say an a NFL football season where guys get their feet stepped on their ankles rolled up on their knees rolled up on their they come in it's like man this guy's got a quad contusion and all this blood under his you know under his thigh right now well yeah I don't expect the jump to look really good at all. Right? Right. Sure. I would add in like when we were thinking of reliability, the easiest way I think to visualize this is what we're trying to identify is how much of the change in score between two different tests is due to something other than error. Right. That so if it's reliable, what we're saying is high reliability means that when I see a different measurement, something has caused this other than the process of my gathering of these data. Now it can be individual variation. So test to test, the individual will perform differently each time. It can also be change in whatever the underlying construct is. So let's say we're testing weekly or daily, like Patrick was talking about, we might see that variation of actual change in score over time. So let's say someone's getting stronger or whatever the case may be, but we can also measure then the individual variability, right? So somebody being tired, somebody, and there's very terminology for this but i think a key thing is we say this is reliable well what what does that mean reliability anchors directly onto how much uh spread there is in the data so if you have a cluster of tests that are all very very close reliability is going to be lower because a small change in that error just from a basically when we think about we're changing the numerator and denominator, small change has a more significant effect rather than when we're looking at a very large spread, we have room for a little bit more error. Um, so I, again, I, I think to support Patrick's idea, that 15% brings up the other big problem, which is uh, dichotomization of continuous variables. Right. So is somebody at 14% good and somebody at 16 bad? It's so this is again going back to instead of point estimates, starting to talk about distributions. We do need threshold ideas, but it's not in this binary sort of sense. It's more, all right, this person has gone from eight to 20. We know that about there's about a 5% that's just the error of us collecting this data. So we do know we've seen a change. Is this relative to what we typically see? Or is this abnormal for this individual? And then this is where from a decision-making process, that is part of the decision calculus. You also need to then understand how much risk am I willing to deal with, right? So you're not cutting somebody based off of a single metric because you understand that single metric has a lot of error around it. And it's just informing your decision-making based off of that individual's current status, the demands that they're going to go into, and then the risk you're willing to take. If we think of this from the um, start framework that Ian Schreier talks about. I was just going to say like the idea of dichotomization, you know, like Scott laid out or binning continuous variables or dichotomization, binning would be more than two. Obviously dichotomization is, is plus minus, right? One or one or the other. 
you always get these weird things at the boundaries. Like like Scott said, 14.9 and 15.01. One, one, one is now bad and the other is good, yet they're both much more similar than 14.9 and 17.8, right? So um, we, we do that stuff because it makes it simple for us to quickly sort things. Um, but like Scott said, if we know how much error there is in the test, we, if we know how much individual variability there is in some way, we can compute a, a range of credible intervals that are plausibly acceptable given the test that we've ob observed. And then, and then you can compute like an integral over that threshold that you think is relevant. So now all of a sudden, what's the probability that this person is actually over our 15% threshold given what we've observed and given what we know the test error is and what the individual error is. And that allows you to calibrate your tolerance for risk, which might change. So for example, Anthony, you might have a hockey player who's the best player on your team and it's the third game of the season and he's coming back from a little bit of a knee injury because he got smashed against the boards. And what you see from your jump test as you're trying to clear him from that integral and from your 15% threshold is that you report, you know what, there's about a only a 10% chance that he's below 15% given what we've observed and the error measurement of the test. And there's a 90% chance that he's potentially still asymmetrical to the point where we'd be uncomfortable with it. Our tolerance for risk with the best player on our team in game three of a 82 game season is probably, you know what? It doesn't hurt us to sit this guy another week or two weeks and let him recover. We can weather the storm. But if we're in game six or seven of the NHL final, we probably want to take that risk now. We're going we're gonna to hope that we're going to end up in the other 10% and that he can play fine in this game and maybe um, go out there and, you know, Kurt Schilling it with the bloody ankle and throw the, you know, pitch the, pitch the game that wins the World Series or something like that. Like so far, we've talked about validity, reliability. We've talked about tolerance for risk. And I think when we go through back to like the education piece, when we go through our education and these things get hand waved away as like these like small little stakes in the ground, all three of those now in like whatever, a 20 minute conversation, we've basically exposed as a continuum of belief based on how willing we are to accept our uncertainties in the world or maybe how willing we are to accept the um, assumptions that are behind the models that we're using to convey these, these uh, uh, numbers, you know, and, and I think that's a really important, you know, probably, probably the most to me, I think at least right now, maybe I'll change my mind tomorrow, but I think th that's like the most important piece of it all is that models are abstractions of the world even if we're talking about a simple model, like a, a normal distribution with a mean and a standard deviation, that's a model. Models are abstractions of the world, and they're only as good as our ability to accept the assumptions that are baked underneath them. And so if we're if we're not happy with those assumptions, if we're not happy with the limitations of that model, then then we probably shouldn't use it within our decision calculus, and we should move on and find something that's more representative or maybe we would say valid of the question we're trying to ask. Yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I understand this because you guys are, have a lot more experience in this than me. Let, let's take the example of force plates. <clears throat> How would we as sports scientists or sport coaches or for me in the private sector, how would I assess the error of one of these tests? Is it a coefficient of variation? Is it a, uh, how do you assess the error? error? And, and here's, here's why I'm, I'm gonna be selfish because I wanna learn from you. Here's what we do with our data. So we've had now three years of force plate information and we, we hone in on three or four variables that we think are critical based on what I would call face validity, what it's important for our sport, okay? And then we create box and whisker plots 
to look at the quartile ranges of what where the outliers are and, and you know where, where the, the the mean median and 50 percent of the data would be and then over the years we essentially add to that list so if you said hey patrick what's good for this or hey hey what would be normal for that at least i can look up reference ranges is that something that we as a strength and conditioning staff need to do meaning we, we need to have more normative data in the research to be able to say what's good what's bad where are the outliers I know that's a long-winded question, and then coming back in full circle, like take an example of any kind of force plate metric. How do we as coaches assess that error? Like, what's the error with that? How do we do that? Is it a simple calculation? Sorry, sorry, that's a windy no, question. No, you're good. <laughs> I'll touch on it briefly, and then let Patrick uh, give the right answer. Um, I think here, <laughs> I, I think we're talking two different things here. One is calculation of reliability and the other thing you're talking about is getting a distribution of norms right so your your distribution of normative data is point estimate or averaging right out to see what your sample uh population looks like the error is how confident are you that that point so if you're thinking of your box and whisker plot and you add let's say you added a dot plot right for each measure on there how confident are you that where that point landed is the actual measure? So in classic in classic test theory, we think of your observed score is equal to the true score plus error. And the true score in this sense would mean if you repeated this test over and over and over and over again, the average would move towards the, quote, true score, which is just the uh, the the true measure that they were putting out on that test. So I think splitting those out would be the first uh, question. It's a good, it is absolutely a good idea to have a understanding of what the population you work with looks like. That's what sense making is about, right? You have to make sense of what's in front of you. Um, I, I have a lot of hesitation with seeing in the literature and extrapolating out because of the fact that most of us who work in these sort of settings deal with a unique population. And there is a lot of, going back to Patrick's uh, comment about, you know, the errors and the assumptions we're making, if we are drawing norms from some data set that somebody else collected on a different population, it, there's a lot of you can do that. You just have to realize that the uncertainty of the air surrounds that a lot. Um, I'll push on to Patrick, but like we have multiple different metrics that we can do from a reliability perspective. And I'll let Patrick discuss those. You know, what Scott laid out about, uh, and, and, and what you laid out, you know, kind of about, about this idea of like norms and, and populations and things like that. I always feel like that's probably the best first step is is uh, we have all these tools that measure things, GPS units and force plates and uh, in-game, you know, in-game data and, and things like that, like uh, wearable track or, or uh, sorry, computer vision and things like that. And I think we rush to build models and do things with that data without really first describing what's there. So I, I having norms or base rates on everything is um is like that's my that's the for me like at work. Whenever someone creates you know whenever a staff member creates a new metric, I'm like don't bring me this unless you can tell me what's good, and what's bad or what's normal, right? Because I, otherwise I have no I can't calibrate myself to a number, uh, and the most you know one of the most basic fundamental questions in science is compared to what, right? This is good compared to what? This is bad compared to what? Compared to who? Compared to which population? You know, if you're dealing with hockey players and you have minor leagues all the way up to the, the pros, it's like, well, knowing that this guy's physical ability at maybe like the division three level is commensurate with what we see in an NHL population, that's really important information. Like that's useful, right? So I think that's an important part. As far as like when it comes to the operate operationalization of I you know figuring out what is reliable or figuring out what is uh I guess what your error is of your tests like the, I mean there's a whole statistical methods <laughs> approach to doing these things 
you know, the first sort of um, first pass, right, to me is always the, the test retest. Like I gave the example of they jumped, we wait five minutes, they jump again. So we, we do that. Uh, like, you know, in, in a rookie mini camp, we would have guys, we'd have the players jump and then go to the back of the line. So, you know, you got 60 players and then you're at the back of the line, you, your turn comes up again and you jump again. Um, because like the first thing is if a, if a metric isn't reliable within a three to five minute rest period, all bets are off when we get into like measuring week to week and the all the context of the you know the player has changed right so that that's my first pass um and so you know th that's like the simple you know uh scott i think scott just like laid it out right it's like uh the true score and you have like a difference and then you have some error around those things and you know you're measuring things like relative reliability absolute reliability you know the the next part is like if it's reliable within that context then i want to know how much do things vary over time? Um, so, you know, now we're talking about like how stable is this metric or how noisy is this metric? And, and that's where, you know, if you have whatever you said, two years or three years, you know, worth of data, like that's where you might start to do things like, you know, construct a, a hierarchical model that allows you to then say like, well, we have this much week to week variance and we have this much that might be explained in the individual and maybe there's other contexts that you can put into that model that tell you like where you are in the in the week of the season because maybe we think you know we have a hypothesis to believe that oh as the season progresses on people get more uh fatigued and blah 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 and that increases the amount of variability we might see in our jumps and maybe the status of the player on the team like if they're a starter and they play you know a full you know i don't i don't Again, like, again, like I, I'm not calibrated to hockey, so I don't know what a full game would be. Like they don't play all three of the shit, all three of the periods. Right. So all three of the 20 minute periods, but maybe like if they play 15 minutes of every, maybe that's a lot. I have no idea, but you, you, you get what I'm saying. Like there, there's other things that might go into that, that now you can build a model that helps you explain why or how much variability we see week to week given the information that we have. And then you can, again, like, like Scott also talked about earlier, like, you know, you build out a nice little forest plot of your team and you have like maybe some week to week differences and you have some measure of error and you have error bars around each observation or maybe little distributions and around each, you know, observation. Um, and, and that now you can start to get to the point of saying, um, given that, given the way in which we're applying this test for the question that we're trying to answer, this is how we're going to take the step forward in modeling it to be able to explain whether the changes that we see from one week to the next for each individual player are outside of what we would normally expect, given what we know about our population and given what we know about this individual in particular. And then with some of those models, you have the opportunity to say, well, we just got this new player traded in and his name is Scott and we know nothing about him, but the model knows that um, if we know nothing about you, the best guess we can make for you, given that you're here and you're our NHL player, you're an, an, an NHL player, and the data that we've collected on that population, our best guess for him is the average of you know, average of the population until we can get enough samples to inform us otherwise. And so then we start to say like, okay, well, it's Scott, he's a forward. Um, he's been in the league for 10 years. Uh, he's, you know, whatever, 32 years old. Uh, he came from another team. This was the number of minutes he's played up to this point in the season. So now we know something about, we, we have some information about Scott. We just don't know about how Scott varies week to week. And so our best guess will be league average, and then slowly we'll be able to move off of that, and that will kind of get washed out. And after a certain number of samples, we say, like, this is Scott, and Scott plays on our team, and we know something about Scott, right? And so that that's how I would think about solving that problem off the top of my head without looking at any data, given the question is, I want to know, 
what's normal versus not normal and how are people changing across the season? So really quick, Scott, before you interject. So that same, that same box and whisker plot and all that data, I can take that data selfishly. I'm asking this and I can calculate from that, the absolute and relative error in that data, correct? Using, and is that, is that, the, the, the box and whisker plot is what? It's your whole population? Yes. Or? Yeah. Like, so th we have it broken down by age group, U18, U16, U15. Okay. And then so they each got, have their own box and whisker they each plot. Have, yeah, exactly. And, uh, and all that information. So all that information is raw in the back. It's an Excel pro uh, spreadsheet. I'm just curious how, if I could take that information and then be able to find from that, uh, I'd, I could ask you off the air in terms of the ICC or whatever, whatever that calculation is trying to find what the, 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 the error is or the noise, whatever it may be in that data. Let me add one thing because I think it's relevant to that question. Something that's key that Patrick was talking about is we think that the error is contained within the device. It is not. The error is the process that you collected the data from. The way you queue is different. The way oh, you set things up is yeah. different. So we are not looking at the error of a device. That typically is calibration. That's ah. a thing that you do. Yeah, the yeah, yeah. error yeah, sense, of yeah. a test, and yeah. this is co Cosmin is a great resource for understanding this. What we are looking at is the way that I interact with these athletes to get to assign this number to the construct I care about. What is the error of that process? And so that that becomes very, very fundamental to understanding everything else moving forward. Yeah, that, that's like a super important one, because like if you're overseeing several strength coaches across your U16, you know, you whatever you say, U12, U14, whatever. Like I can tell you that there are certain strength coaches that when they go to jump the guys, they're like, all right, uh, hands on hips, um, and, you know, three jumps and and then you're good. That, that's the force plate itself is very calibrated you know, provided we calibrated it before we had people step on it. Right. Uh, we moved it around and jacked it up or something, but um, so it's calibrated uh, itself, but the way that the test is administered is very different than the strength coach who goes in, you know, super fired up and is coaching the shit out of it and screaming at the kid that kit's going to give much more effort. That test is going to have less error to it. Yeah. This episode has been brought to you by the High Performance Hockey Masterclass. The High Performance Hockey Masterclass is a comprehensive lecture series exploring the science and practice of the high performers in the sport of ice hockey. It was designed and created and engineered by myself, Anthony Donskoff. It is an eight part lecture series that includes metric fixation, the tyranny of metrics, reading research, what matters, going back to get my PhD as a 40 year old, how do you target your readings in terms of digesting, accumulating and reading your research, biomechanical considerations for ice hockey, the adductor magnus, how we program hip health during the off season and in season, the gain go grow model, this idea of a three day rollover program for high performance hockey players, considerations for the end season, how to manipulate that model for high performers, our communication structure within the confines of Don Scott Strength and Conditioning, and finally, the fast and frugal tree, considerations for return to play. More information on the High Performance Hockey Masterclass can be found at anthonydonscov.gumroad.com. Thanks for listening. So going back to your question of how do you identify the difference, this is why you, you need multiple measures. That's what tells you the difference. But if you take multiple measures and one time you set up your portable plates in, on a rubber floor in one gym, and then the next time you're back at your home place and you've got your regular plate set up on cement and you cue differently one time versus the other, all of these things are contributing to the difference in score. So it's, yes, there might be like, your goal is to always maximize because the closer you get to the maximum, the more stable it is. Sub maximum is very hard to do. So like to Patrick's point, if you're queuing well, you're more likely to have less air because of the fact that you're pushing them to their actual maximum. But you, 
your error comes from doing this test at least twice and seeing what is the difference between those two. And that's why I'm saying the process is so important because a lot of times people said, well, we use force plates both times. And you're not measuring the error of the force plate, you're measuring the error of your process. And so you need your process to be stable because remember we were talking earlier about um, reliability being the different score, how much of that difference is due to the athlete versus due to the error of your process. It's your job to make sure the error of your process is as stable as possible so that most of the change score that you see comes from the athlete. So And so now that brings us back to full circle to your your question in my head the, the way you're describing the data without looking at it and these box and whisker plots and i could be wrong but I, what i'm thinking is you have a bunch of players under 14 a bunch of players under 16 a bunch of players dot 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 under and age group and they're all tested once and you have a distribution oh, no. that gives oh, you a mean and standard. They're tested. They're tested throughout the entire season. So about at least seven touch points. I, we, we try to do it once, uh, twice a month. So we've got about seven or eight touch points in the season for each okay. age group. Yep. yep. Got it. Yeah. So, yep. so then, yeah. So um, the first approach, you know, as I, as I talked about would be like just the simple test, retest reliability. And just like Scott talked about, right. Um, the process needs to be the same. So it's like the force plates are sitting there in the same spot in the gym. It's the same strength coach. He's going to coach it the same way. Kid does, you know, kid A does the test, goes to the back of the line. Three to five minutes later, he's back at the front of the line. Kid A does the test again, right? Now we have two tests. We have a with three columns of data, right? Column uh, name or athlete ID or whatever it is. Um, test one, test two, right? So there, there's the, that, that's the first kind of first pass. How, you know, and like, I would be curious, even with that, how good your, the threshold that you had set, you know, even makes, makes sense for your, um, you know, for your population. Maybe it came from a different population. Maybe it's something that people said, oh, 10% is, we don't want 10%. And, all of a sudden you look at your population and you're like, well, geez, that's like 90% of these kids. That's a problem. Just, like, just, what are we about? just curious to not interjecting, but has, has there been times in your career, Patrick, like as a sports scientist where you say, Oh my God, I looked at data that, that we're, to we're throwing that test out. That's way too noisy. Like, Oh my all God. The time. Like, all all the just, time. Just, just, my God, it's terrible. All, all the time. People, yep. people collect stuff and they say like, Hey, what do you think of this? And I'm like, i you can collect it if you want, but don't bring it to me. I'm not going to do anything with it. There's nothing. Yeah, and, here. And, and here's the crazy part. How many, and I'm not saying this, look, I'm pointing the thumb. Like, so how many of these conversations do we have as strength coaches on Twitter? Never. <laughs> it's, it's, you know what I mean? Like I say, never, I don't want to say that in a negative way, I, but I mean, I, I'm, I'm pointing my thumb to me, to me, a lot of what's going on is just collecting and then, and collecting and then and then then creating a narrative after I you and I talked about this before there's no need to bring up the subject but this idea of the Texas sharpshooter you know you're shooting 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 and then you draw the target after I need I'm pointing the thumb at me on this one like I'm guilt like I need to start throwing things away and I need to do this not I don't need a research article to publish I need to do it myself to find out can you give me yep. an example you don't need to tell me a technology but can you give me an example of something like where you're just like oh my god we, we thought we were going to measure this and just it was just too noisy yeah, the <laughs> squat jump, squat jump. Yeah. Um, you just start we, looking we threw that at, out. Yeah, yeah, why? Because nobody does it well. Like I don't have the bandwidth to teach it well enough. And when you look at the numbers, almost all of the people are doing a little counter movement. And so to get it to be accurate in the sense of people are actually just doing the concentric took me about six to eight sessions when I was doing serial measures with the group I was working with at the time. And so it's not worth it. We throw that out. We just use the counter movement. And because that one within two to three uh, sessions, things start stabilizing. Yeah. Like the, that's a good point too. Is like a lot of things make, a lot of things are really reliable and stable in, in a research setting, you know, like uh, mid, mid five pull is a great one because it's like, if you read the literature and like Mike Stone's group and they're like, well, you, you actually, if you really want to do this, right, you have to tape their hands to the bar. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, well, 
Yeah, when you have uh, <laughs> good when luck. You have 60 kids in the gym. <laughs> that's right. Who, who the hell is going to be standing there <laughs> taping hands to the ball? That's like, right. You do that? Like you can't operationalize it. So taping the hands to the bar or not, this is that's the process. So if you don't tape the hands to the bar, that's fine. You're adding variance. And what you're doing is now you are adding that error. And so when you calculate your uh, ICC or whatever you use, that is baked in. You just understand that you cannot extrapolate out hands taped to the bar the same way you can hands not taped to the bar. Yeah, so that, well that's put. a good point. And the other part before you, before you change topics, the other part is – in thinking about your data, like all we did was talk about test, retest, like, but you have these players over time. And what's also interesting here about your data and your players and, and has to be thought about is that you not only have the week to week variance that occurs from playing hockey, you have under 12s, under 14s. These are growing kids. So this very much turns into a growth model. It turns into a model that's showing change over time that might not be linear, but it might be some sort of, you know, squiggle or spline uh, based on the fact that at certain periods of that testing, as the kids going through your, uh, uh, you know, your, your, your process of whatever, seven years of playing hockey, um, they're changing at different rates throughout that given, you know, how they're growing and stuff like that. And so, that adds, you know, so then, you you know, when you say, oh, yeah, most of the guys were outside of 15 percent, it's like, well, you know, to, to Scott's uh, example of like you can remove the tape from the hands, but now you've added some more variance into your measure, your, some more error into your measure. Like think about what growth is doing. So, so maybe that 15 percent threshold was nice in an NHL population, but maybe it's like wildly you know, different for a population of kids that are all growing at different rates and different things are going on like that. That's something else that needs to be considered. So, yeah, I think Lisa Hoffman calls it within person fluctuation versus within person change. And those are the two things we're actually looking at. So uh, if she does a phenomenal job of describing like uh, uh, to give an example of that, um, like within person fluctuation would be that like your heart rate fluctuates throughout the day. Like I'm sitting down now, if I stood up and went outside to run, my heart rate goes up in order to meet the physical, you know, the physical demands and mobilize substrates. Then I get back, then I might have some food. Then I lie down and take a nap and my heart rate's constantly fluctuating based on what I'm doing, but it's not necessarily changing. But over time, let's say I start a running program, my heart rate is fluctuating on a minute by minute basis throughout the day. But those fluctuations might have a long-term trend that shows the change. My resting heart rate is going down. My, my morning resting heart rate is going down as I get more fit. It's like the stock market shows like a lot of day-to-day -day or a lot of minute to second to second change as the money moves. But there's a long-term, uh, oh, sorry, fluctuation as the money moves. But there's a long-term change that's going on that's um, dependent on, you know, much greater things with respect to the economy, right? I, I I want to slightly pivot here, and I want to respect your time. Um, so uh, this is a lot of Franco's early work. So uh, Franco would probably say, Anthony, you know, this was written a long time ago. Uh, but I really got in in in, in um, uh, really impressed with some. I think it was a 2005 or 2006 article. So that in science, that's eons ago. But he talked about conceptual frameworks. And I got like really geeky about this. And I, I don't know if I'm just wasting time spinning my wheels, but here are some of the stuff. Patrick, you, you uh, recommended a, an outstanding book on, on measurement. And I, you, have, you and I have read it. I've read it twice, and I still have way more questions than answers. It's, got, it's that orange book. You know, the, you know what I'm talking about? Measurement and medicine. Measurement and medicine. Measurement and medicine. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, um, and, and it talked about a couple things. So and I, I want to see if I can address these and, and tell me, a, if they have any business in the applied setting, because again, our, our demographic here is strength coaches. So this is not research scientists. So talking about number one, operationalize, meaning what is a definition of what you want? Meaning strength. Hey, that's, that's really broad. What kind of strength? Like, what are we talking about here? Operationalize it. Then create a concept of that. Like what is involved in that? Uh, whatever this rate of force development. Um, 
and then slowly kind of piecing your way through this, what they would call a conceptual model to come up with what it is you want to measure. And Franco, I believe would say this reduces degrees of freedom. So I ah, yeah, measuring strength. Well, wow. you know, I can do this. You hone on on one thing and you're not able to, you know, weasel your way out. You're measuring what you're intended to measure from the start, if that makes any sense, doing a poor job. So, <laughs> no, you're, so what Patrick was talking about earlier where he said, you know, somebody says, hey, I want to use a GPS. And his first question is, for what? what? To what end? That is what a conceptual framework is. The conceptual framework is, so we have theoretical versus conceptual framework. And usually theoretical is you are pulling in a theory that's already out there. Conceptual is kind of, you are putting together a, you're using multiple concepts to create your own. Uh, so to whether or not it's important, yeah, absolutely it's important. That's that's what we run off of any time we apply like specific adaptation to impose demand is our concept of how things adapt relative to this. Operationalization is when we say strength, how are you assigning those numbers to that variable? So you say strength, and what you mean by strength is peak force on your isometric mid-thigh pull, rate of force development between zero and 250 milliseconds, max squat, five rep max, shoulder, you know, ash test. All right. And that's your definition. Now you've operationalized. When you say strength, what you mean is those tests. So that's kind of where uh, I see. So I personally say, like to Patrick's point, it's absolutely important. It's just a fancy term for the exact same thing that, of what are you trying to do with this? Do you understand what you're trying to do? Same thing, Patrick. Agreed. Like in the yeah, in the, yeah, in the applied yeah. setting, are you are you using that conceptual framework when you're coming up with you know, or is it just something that's just second nature to you in your brain? You work through it from a you know from a, or are you literally putting pen to paper at times? I always so uh, whenever we create something new, I do document like this is what you know, this is what the question is. This is what we hope to get from it. Um, this is how we want to use it. And this is how we're going to operationalize it. So I do always write that down. Uh, and I have to write it down, right? Because if I'm going to go end to end, like if I, if you sent me some data and you just said, Hey, uh, just get me some like means and standard deviations and box and whisker plots. Like, yeah, okay, that's fine. I don't need to do that. If that's what you want, well, great. But if we're going to go end to end and I'm going to work through like first spending a bunch of time describing this data and this thing that we're doing and trying to understand and what's there and what's not there and what assumptions might we be making and what might we be missing and what might we need. And then I'm going to build a model or several models and compare them and figure out what is doing what, maybe simulate some data and try it out in the models and see how they beh behave. And then I'm going to build the final piece, which is operationalize a web page that someone can access this information, get the results, see the results over time, whatever the question is. I have to write that down, the, those things down, because it keeps me aligned with the process of the steps. You know, it's like, okay, where am I now in this process? It, 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 this, this is like goes into like frameworks, like the CRISP DM framework or the PPDAC framework, the um, problem plan data analysis and conclusion framework, those kinds of things. Those keep me anchored to how, you know, we have an idea, we have a, a, a conceptual framework of what we want to measure and what we're going to measure and, and what we hope to get from it. How am I going to make this work? And so I, I'm actually like writing that stuff down. Like, okay, what I'm at this step. Like, what do I need now? Oh uh, shit. Okay, I need to get this data. I need to clean that. I need to look at that. I need to make sure that's correct. Okay, now I can move to the next step. Otherwise, like, and you see this in young analysts, uh, like we've had where they just take the data and immediately build a model and plow a bunch of data through it and get a result. And then they're like, here it is. Like, it's kind of good. And I'm like, oh uh wait a minute did you think about like i know what this data is so did you think about this this and this like no i didn't think i thought it would just be like cleaned data already and i'm like well or i threw away no I, you know what i discarded any players that uh didn't do this and i'm like well th 
what do you think that does to the model, right? Like a great book is Alan Downey's probably overthinking it because like every chapter is a different look at paradoxes in statistics. And he does this, it's written for the lay person, but he does this by taking like modern day news articles and saying like, this is what they said, but these are the assumptions underneath it. And what that book does is it gives you a real appreciation for sample bias. <laughs> and yeah. then you immediately read the book and you're like, oh, nothing works. Everything <laughs> is crap. Like I give up. Um, and so that's why I have to write these things down to your point, because if I don't, I commit and I still commit errors and we always do. And, you know, some errors I, I make and I, I'm not sure that they're errors yet. And I'm because I'm, I'm naive to them. We always commit these things. Um, the more I can be aware of them or the more I can be aware of, hey, I know that I'm doing this and it's a limitation of the model, but I'm willing to accept it right now because um, I, I know kind of where this model will fall on the decision framework. Knowing those things allows you to break the rules a little bit and know how to work backwards from things. And that's probably the most compelling piece of Bayes that that I find is, is like, I can't just take data and put it into a model and get a result. I have to really think about what's there. And in the process of thinking about what's there, it strengthens my belief in the model or the frame, the, the conceptual framework that I'm working on. I would also add that from a idea of a conceptual framework, this is what drives your question. So like to Franco's point about reducing the degrees of freedom, your conceptual framework is what tells you what you would expect. So if our conceptual framework, and we can have formative or reflective type models here, if we think of a uh, formative model, it's multiple things coming together to create. So let's say return to play readiness. That could be our uh, model. And it's formed by uh, how long you are since surgery, how much training volume you've uh, accomplished, what are your symmetry on our five different measures of strength, et cetera. All of those metrics come together to form this idea of return to readiness. And so from our model, we would anticipate that a change in something like our symmetry score would impact their readiness for return to play. Um, whereas readiness for return to play being different does not necessarily impact their symmetry. Whereas if we think of strength, and let's say strength is our uh, reflective model, what, what are the things that uh, would be based off? Well, rate of force development, we would be surprised if rate of force development didn't change with strength. We'd be surprised if peak force didn't change. We'd be surprised if their five rep max didn't change. We'd be surprised if impulse over time didn't change. So now we have these things. If strength changed, then we should see a change in rate of force development or any of those other metrics. So if we have our model, and that's really conceptual framework is just a higher order. How do we know why we do what we do? If I want to get somebody stronger, why do I load them with you know five sets of five because we love Bill Stark? Um, it's because <laughs> we, we understand physiologically and neurologically that is our conceptual framework. It's this is what happens when exposed to higher level of load. We get an increase in rate coding. We get an increase in motor firing. We get increased neuromuscular coordination. That's a conceptual framework. And so we then say, I do this because I understand what I would anticipate. We're making those predictions. And that's what, to Patrick's point, that's what lets you then know what questions to ask because your framework is telling you this is where you should explore. Uh, Patrick, do you have another five minutes? I just want to make sure we, I respect your time. Yeah, um, yeah. I get, I get really, uh, maybe it's just my lack of knowledge. I get really antsy with when it comes to this model idea. I feel like I'm the king of the Texas sharpshooters. I collect and I, you know, I can paint the fancy, Hey, here's your, you know, here's your, uh, you know, your standard deviation. Here's your mean medium. I got your top 5% of this. I can display the data. Great. Awesome. When it comes to taking that and putting it into a model. Do you have that, for example, do you have models based on, I know you, you back in the days, you, you always broke things down on stress, movement, and performance. Do you have models for that? How do you, once you take that information, when you say models, is this something, 
you intrinsically do? Is it a weighted score that you create some model with? Or is this like SPSS? Like, what do you mean by, can you give me an example of a model? <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, well, what, what I mean by, I guess, yeah, what I mean by model is like, um, probably a rudimentary question. So I apologize, any, but I want to learn. You know, and, and yeah, no, no, anything, you know, anything that allows us to take in data and in some way output a value that we either are using to predict or to explain or describe or draw inference from. So your, your box plot with, you know, mean and standard deviation or, or median and quantile intervals or, or interquartile range or something like that. I mean, in theory, that is a model, right? It's, it's a, it's a single value model. It gives us a distribution, right? Um, the world is obviously more complex than single value models often. So um, when I think about um, trying to then model that outcome of like what is changing our RSI over time, now I'm trying to think of what are the other variables that might be contributing to this change that we see all the things that we talked about, you know, how many minutes you played in the last game and age and where you are in your growth maturation and, you know, yada, yada, yada. And so to go from that, you know, that conceptual framework of like, these are the things that impact the, the thing I care about, the RSI change. Um, I need to be able to build a statistical model that allows us to, explain um why you know, explain what we see and whether what we see is outside of what we would you know i think scott what did he just use the the term like outside of what would surprise us or not like oh wow this is this change that we saw like given what we know like we wouldn't expect to see a change like this what does that potentially mean and what should we do about it so sometimes that's like building a model like a regression model or you know you know logistic regression model or whatever insert whatever sometimes that's um like you said like that could be like weighted scores and things like that like a, a lot the choice of the statistical approach to me is less relevant than having a good question so like you know because because you can do a lot you you can cover a lot of ground if you have really good questions and you can use regression. Like you can cover a ton of ground because regression underpins everything else. Regression is a t-test. Regression is an ANOVA. Regression is a correlation. Like you, you can prove all those things to yourself with simple math. You can cover a lot of ground with that. You don't need uh, uh, deep learning models and random forests and trees and all these other things. Um, sometimes those are useful when things get really, really complex. And when you have tons of data that um, you can, you can, you know, effectively use those things. But for the most part, most of the things that we're asking are relatively simple. They take a few inputs. And if we have a really good question, we can map something to that question that allows us to at least have one extra component within our decision calculus that in, helps inform what it is we're about to do. Yeah, because ultimately models are lies, but they're lies that we tell us to allow us to orient ourselves to a world that is too complex for us to make decisions with it. So there's nothing, there's nothing worse than a complicated lie, right? That's very hard to deal with. And we also think of this as like, we want models that work, not models that look like the thing. So the classic example is a paper airplane. That's a model plane that flies versus the model plane that you put together that looks exactly like the thing and you throw it, it doesn't fly. That's the difference between a model that works and one that doesn't. So we want a simple model that represents the reality well enough to accomplish what it is that we're looking for. Uh, Alice Adventures in Wonderland has a great commentary in there on models where they were trying to make a map and they just kept trying to make the map more and more accurate until they had their scale was one mile to one mile. 
And uh, so it's basically the exact replication of the kingdom. And they asked, you know, how's that map worked out? Well, we we can't unroll it because the farmer said it would kill the crops, right? So now we're just now we're just using the kingdom itself as our model, and it seems to work pretty well. So these are all the errors that we tend to run to. I really like John Boyd talks about this is, um, you know, progress is confusion at a higher level. The idea is that we're trying to have multiple models since we understand that they're all lies, but they're lies that allow us to conceptualize and orient ourselves to the complex changing dynamic environment. So if we have multiple models, that helps us orient ourselves, right? One point is just a point, two points is a line, three points is a plane, four points is space. The more points we get to orient ourselves to, the better better we are at understanding where we are in relation to what it is that we're trying to make a decision to, falling back on that idea of validity from earlier. So like what Patrick's talking about, why do we use statistics? Because the complexity is so high that we can't just have a back of the envelope type heuristic where, uh, you know, if we see this person and he looks happy while he's jumping, then he's probably okay. That doesn't tell us like that. That is not something that we can infer any validity to our conclusion. And so what statistics do, do is they take all of this complicated uh, you know, data that we've measured, that we've looked at, and it says, you know what, I, I know that this isn't true. However, it's close enough that it lets you make a better decision than if you did not know this. And so that's where, again, earlier Patrick was talking about all these models are based off of the assumptions that we're making. We are conceding that in these this perfect scenario, this is what would happen. We realize that we're not dealing with that. However, it is enough information to allow us to orient ourselves better than we would do if we did not have those models. And the last point I'll make is this is the problem with a bad model is it increases our confidence without increasing the actual uh, decision making. So our orientation is wrong and confident. Sometimes the best thing we can do is just say, we do not know this. Approach the world understanding that you are uncertain. And that's that's fine. It's I use the analogy of going into your bedroom with the lights off. You know where everything is. You move around at the same speed. If your partner rearranged the furniture and did not tell you, you go in there confident that your mental model of the room is a reflection of reality and you run into something. However, if your partner yelled at you before you go in, hey, listen, I rearranged the furniture. You do not know where anything is but you approach that room very, very differently because you understand the level of uncertainty that you're dealing with. And I, that's kind of, for me, where a lot of this stuff comes down to is most of the time in an applied setting, it's really just about understanding that we don't know there's uncertainty and we need to, this is where the Kinevin framework and some of these things come in. We respond differently when we understand that the situation is different from an uncertainty perspective. Yeah. And, and accounting for the uncertainty um, is the real important piece and making sure that because the models are lies, making sure that you be to, to, to deploy the model, it has to be better than the current benchmark, the current state of knowledge. So if my best state of knowledge is the practitioner saying, yep, player's ready to go. Nope, player's not ready to go. Yep, player's ready to go. Nope, player's not ready to go. And we look at how how um, correct they've been historically. And I can create a model that tests a few of these things. Scott laid out like five things in the return to play framework. And that beats the current benchmark. Then I'm foolish to not at least use that model as a component within my decision strategy because it's better than what we're currently using. And then hopefully I find something better from there because I have new information or new beliefs or new hypotheses to test or new data to collect or whatever. But that you, you, you're always trying to beat a benchmark. Last question um, uh, for the both of you. And, and I know we got time here, so maybe a, a minute answer. And this is a tough one, but... You guys are both what I would consider serial specialists. You guys are Swiss Army knives. Like Patrick, I, I told you about. Like you're a strength and conditioning coach. You're a data scientist. You, you you got you wear so many different hats. 
I want to be a Patrick Ward. I'm not being funny. I, I want to catch my knowledge back up. Give advice to someone in the applied setting. That's a strength coach or a performance coach. If you had to do it all over again, I don't want to say like, take the exact same path. How could you start with a foot up? Like, what, what is there certain books that you'd recommend to read? Is it is it thinking differently about the data that you that or the the questions that you ask? Um, what advice would you give an aspiring performance coach? They just got their exercise science degree, knowing what you know now. So uh, there's a few key points. The first one is everything comes at a cost. If you act like people will say, how do you balance all of these things? I don't. There's a lot of sacrifices that are made in order to do other things. So that that's fundamental. And that, it's not that it's good or bad. It's an amoral. It's amoral. It's you decide what matters to you. If if you don't want to be an expert on something, that's fine. Partner with people who are. So I think yeah, well, that's the well first put. one is yeah, well it is perfectly acceptable to not be an expert across multiple domains. You should understand it briefly, uh, but you should just partner with people who are experts. That's that's probably the biggest thing. If you do want to go beyond that, read broadly outside of your domain, like we were talking about measurement, 140 plus years of information on this in other domains, whereas we have, you know, maybe five, 10 years of people seriously considering it in our own domain, right? So realize that a lot of questions have been answered somewhere else. So being uh, being aware of things outside of your domain is probably the single biggest thing. The second one is you just have to, that idea of epistemic iteration is also the same. I reread things all the time because my understanding of what I'm learning has changed based off of what I've learned elsewhere. So it's not that you learn the thing and then you move forward. It's you learn a thing and then you learn something else and then you go back and now you're seeing the new thing in better context. And you're like, boy, I was an idiot, you know, two years ago. And it's the idea of um, uh, basically being right versus having been right. We should be constantly working to be right which is abandoning prior beliefs, prior thoughts as we get more information. Whereas having been right is trying to defend what you thought previously. So that would be my, uh, I, it's not maybe specific, but I think the first point I made is probably the single biggest one. It's okay not to, and understand that everything comes at a cost and just identify what matters to you. Yeah, uh, that's pretty good. I, It's hard to disagree with anything there. Uh, probably because we're very similar people in that, in that regard, uh, everything does come with a cost. And so that that's the first part is like, you know, people would always tell me you, you wait, you spend all this time, uh, you all weekend, you'll sit in a coffee shop and read and do things. And, and you're not like getting out and, uh, going out into the, you know, go out and hike or go out and see the world or go out and do something else. Like, why are you spending all this time reading? And, um, I, I at first I kind of like was always like, oh, yeah, kind of sucks, huh? But then like I realized, you know what? Like those are the things that make you happy. But the things that make me happy are chasing knowledge and sitting down and reading and, uh, you know, sit and having a coffee with Scott and talking about this stuff and things like that. So um, I think the first is just an awareness of who you are and the things that you want to do and the things that you like. Reading outside of your domain is probably one of the best pieces of advice you can give, give and or get. Um, I tell this to our young analysts all the time, right? Like they they read um, uh, sports analytics papers, and that's it. Like sports papers, right? And I'm like, you really you're really limiting yourself to understand methods if all you do is read within one domain. So I spend time reading in like ecology, psychology, biology, you know? And so when we get presented with a problem, the young analysts might sit there and say, um, what do you think, how do you think we should solve this? Like, I remember this baseball paper and I'm like, oh, 
this is the German tank problem. Uh, you can totally use Bayes for this. Like it's a grid and we just put probabilities in each grid and then we, you know, compute over them. And, and they're like, what are you talking about? I'm like, oh, no, no, I got it. I got it. And it's only, it, it's, it's not that I'm like smarter than them. I, I don't think I am actually, but it's just that I, I've had more time like reading other things where I can see some parallels that maybe the other people aren't seeing like they're you know, so like, um scott mentioned lisa tomlin uh tomlinson like yeah like her whole whole you know she's like a psych quantitative psychologist but like everything in that book or everything that the guys on quantitude who are also quantitative psychologists talk about with respect to measuring the ways in which children coming from dysfunctional backgrounds like you know grow and meant you know their mental aptitude and capacity to do things all of that stuff is not sport but everything they're doing relates back to sport in some way because it's like i can totally solve i can solve this problem of looking at college players going to the nfl by thinking about the ways in which they looked at a problem of children from um, alcoholic parents and how they progressed from junior high to high school there's something in there that allows me to capture a method that says, oh, I can file that in my back of my head because I can use that. So that, that's a really important one as well. You know, I, I'd say, you, you know, coding languages are useful, like spending some time trying to learn to code uh, is, is, is super invaluable if, if this is the world that you want to live in. Like you're probably not going to get there with SPSS. Uh, I do a lot of things from first principles, I'll do them in Excel or I'll do them in code. Um, because again, back to that idea of if I can work out what's going on by hand, I know what the rules are. And so then I know how to break the rules if I need to break them. And I'm willing to accept the assumption that I'm breaking them under. So learning a little bit of code, you know, like discovering statistics in R by Andy Field is probably not just about code but it's like probably one of the best stats books i've ever read it's just you know 800 pages of uh, I, I like yeah it's just intense i mean it's got everything in there and it's got everything laid out in first principles for about 40 pages before he ever gets to code in every single chapter and so that's a great i mean that's a great book like i literally would go through that book page by page um and just like yeah learn work on it um analyzing baseball in data in r by jim albert is a really fantastic book on coding in sport and less so about building models but more so about thinking probabilistically about things and i think that's an important one where you know the two things that get hand waved away the most for us in our in our one stats class that most of us take through our education is uh, um, validity and, and measurement, not validity and reliability, but measurement in general, and then probability. And uh, like probability for the enthusiastic beginner um, by, uh, let's, I always I always have it like next to my desk, this uh, David Morin, um, so he's a Harvard professor, and this is like all of his notes from his course encapsulated in a textbook. And it's uh, like, this is a brilliant book. There's no code in it. It's all just probability, but like, if you sat down and worked through the examples in Excel or in R or Python or whatever you want to use, I mean, you could do it on paper, um, you would learn an immense amount about how the world works and thinking about problems uh, that you're solving every day. And so I think those kinds of things help uh, a lot. You know, other kind of like coffee table reads, probably overthinking it is a great one. Um, Calling Bullshit by Carl Bergstrom is a great one. Yep. Yep. Uh, uh, Signal and the Noise was a good one, I, I, I thought. Um, Against the Gods, uh, which is a book all about the history of risk and probability, is a fascinating read. And if you really want to read a brilliant book that's about the history of statistics and how we think statistically, uh, the lady tasting tea. I got it based it, on your it, recommendation. Yeah, that's one of the <laughs> most fascinating. And yeah. then I think if you want one that's on the history of Bayes, um, uh, it's it's called I think it's called uh, the algorithm that wouldn't die. How Bayesian 
you know, statistics change the world or something like that. But that book is just brilliant. Again, like that's the one that was, that was one where I was like, yeah, you read the whole chapter on the German tank problem. And then someone asks a question and it's like, you know, so we've seen this player be able to run this fast. What's the probability that they could run faster than that? And it's like, oh yeah, like what's the probability that we capture a tank and we see a serial number greater than the serial number of all the tanks that we've already captured because that tells us how many tanks are in the German fleet. And then you start to think about like, okay, how could I put a distribution on that and then compute probabilities going forward and what, you know, and then with every observation, all of a sudden it starts to shrink and it's like, no, no, we're really confident this guy does that and he can't do anything higher. Or man, we haven't seen enough, but we think there's a chance. Like you start to like, you know, those yeah. kinds of books I think are really fun. So yeah, that's yeah. And, and then playing the electrical guitar by Patrick Ward. What a or freaking guitar you player. Come on, there. man. I hey, listen, if any listeners are out there, if you're friends with Patrick Ward on Facebook, you need to post him more on Twitter. This guy is a, a music like they just rocks just speaks on the guitar man i'm giving you a huge compliment i listen to every one that you post just know oh, that brother wow. Thank you. Thank hey, you. i want to i want to respect both of your time today guys our guests today have been patrick ward and scott morrison gentlemen thanks so much for educating us it was a pleasure